right. Good morning, APU family. How are you doing this morning? Oh, come on. There's four weeks of instruction left, people. How are we doing? <laughs> All right. Well, my name is Aaron Hinojosa, and I'm the executive director for the Student Center for Reconciliation and Diversity. And I want to welcome you today, this morning, as we focus on diversity uh, this week in the next uh, few chapels. Uh, we have an opportunity to, oh, here we go. We have an opportunity uh, to take time to, to focus on some matters of the heart, um, one of them being diversity. Part of student life, um, we, we, we ask that you focus on a few things. Some of those things that we ask you to focus on are spiritual formation, wellness, local and global engagement, community, and diversity. So this week, we're taking the time to focus on diversity. So Dr. Cleveland, who's going to come up and speak for us next, you have, a, you have a great opportunity to hear from one of the most um, amazing scholars around the topics of diversity and theology and what it means to, to live into the community that we're in. Dr. Cleveland is a social psychologist with a hopeful passion for reconciling across cultural divisions. She is the first associate professor of the practice of reconciliation at Duke University Divinity School, where she's also the faculty director of Duke's Center for Reconciliation. A graduate of Dartmouth College, Cleveland also holds a PhD from the University um, of California in Santa Barbara. She's the author of Disunity in Christ, Uncovering the Hidden Forces That Keep Us Apart. And because this is also the beginning of um, baseball season, I wanted to throw in that she's from the Bay Area. She's an avid A's fan. Born in Oakland and, and also raised in Fremont. Let's uh, welcome Dr. Christina Cleveland. us at Duke too. Um, we only have about four weeks left of classes and if you think you're stressed with your assignments and everything, you should, you should consider us poor faculty who grade them all. So um, we're busy too and you know um, it's a lot of work for us but we do it out of love. So look at your syllabus and the longer it is the more evidence of um, our love for you there is there and, and really God's love. So um, I want to take some time to invite us to sort of center ourselves. This is a wonderful week. I'm excited to kick it off, and I'm excited for all the ways that you'll be invited to live into this amazing vision that God's given us that was inaugurated with the resurrection, which we just celebrated. But if you're anything like me, when you're really busy and you're stressed and you're tired, it's easy to miss things. It's easy to um, not lean in to something that God might have simply because we're just kind of all over the place. And I can relate to that too. So I want to take some time to invite us to just center ourselves in God's love, God's goodness, God's unconditional acceptance, the reality that we're all created in the image of God. And one way that I do that is by practicing um, an old Ignatian prayer. And so I'm going to invite you to participate in it with me. And it's so simple. So I'll, um, I'll say a phrase and then you can repeat after me. And then we'll have a moment of silence and then I'll say another phrase and you can repeat after me. And i um, you'll get the hang of it. All right, so let's pray. Be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that I am. Be still and know. Be still. Be still. Be. Be. God, we invite you into this time and we ask that you give us joy, that you shake off any defensiveness that we might have, that you 
Holy Spirit, help our hearts to lean into what you might have for us and that we walk away feeling challenged but also invited into something bigger and better. In Jesus' name, amen. So um, like Aaron said, I grew up in the San Francisco Bay Area, love being from that, that place, love the A's, and excited for baseball season to get kicked off again. But when I was 15 years old, um, I left Fremont, California because I got this in this weird twist of events. I got invited, um, I got a full scholarship to attend a boarding school in New Hampshire. So I went all the way from California, left my family, moved to uh, a small little tiny town called Exeter, New Hampshire. And when I arrived at this school, I was one of the few people of color there. And I was also one of the few middle class kids. Most of my fellow students were wealthy and were white and were from the Northeast. And it became pretty clear to me that most of my white um, fellow students had not interacted a whole lot with people of color. And somehow I became really good friends with this guy named John, who was from upstate New York and was really wealthy. And um, as we were talking one day, it became really clear to me that I was his only black friend ever. Um, and I said to him, John, I'm pretty sure I'm your only black friend. And he said, Christina, that's not true. My maid is black. That was his response, okay? And I was like, wow, um, I would love to know if she actually thinks you guys are friends. But that was his reality. So one day, I was hanging out with my friend Kai. Now, Kai is black. I was friends with all the black students at the school. And we were playing ping pong in my dorm. And John came in while we were playing. And he must have been looking for someone else because he wasn't planning on coming to hang out with me. And I thought, wow, what an opportunity. I will introduce Kai to John. I will double John's friends right here in this, black friends right here in this moment. And this will be great. So I said, John, meet Kai. Kai, meet John. And Kai said, hey, it's nice to meet you. And he, he said to her, wait a second, I know you. You're in my math class. And Kai said, um, actually, I am not in your math class. And John said, yes, you are. You're definitely in my math class. And she said, no, I don't think so. Now, you need to know something about this school. They use the Socratic method for teaching, so every class has like nine students. So you really should know who's in your math class. Um, and so they go back and forth, and finally Kai says, I'm sorry, I'm just not in your math class. And he says, exasperated, well, some black girl who looks just like you is in my math class. Hmm. So I see a lot of people of color in the audience, and they're smiling to themselves. And white people are kind of like, wait, what do I do? Do I smile? Is it okay to laugh? Like, I don't know. Tell me what to do. Um, awkward, right? Awkward. So it turns out that our friend Addie, who looks nothing like Kai, but is black, was in his math class, right? And so John made this classic mistake all black people look the same. They all look the same. This is something that we social psychologists call the outgroup homogeneity effect. We think that they are all the same. They all look the same, they all talk the same, they all think the same. It's really easy for us to confuse one person with another, but we are all unique. So they are all the same, but we are all unique. Now, I will say white people are not the only ones who make this mistake. So you can all, all white people in the room, you can breathe and be like, it's not just us. Okay, so the thing is, is everybody makes this mistake. It doesn't matter if you're a majority, if you're a minority. We tend to think that they are all the same, whoever they is. Now, I'll give you an example. Um, there's this interesting, I think it's a wonderful website. It's called Stuff White People Like. I don't know if you've ever heard of it. And it's a list of all the things that white people like. Now, it's written by this guy who's white, and he's writing it sort of sarcastically to people of color. That way, if you're a person of color and you wanna know what white people like, you can just go to this list and learn all about white people. Okay, so things on the list are like um, assists in basketball. White people love assists. Um, <laughs> White people love microbreweries. White people love religions their parents don't belong to, etc. Okay, so one of the things that he says is white people love outdoor performance clothes, right? You know how white people are always wearing a North Face jacket even when they're not about to climb a mountain? Like, that's what he's talking about. So 
This is what he says on his blog. He says, the main reason why white people like these clothes is that it allows them to believe that at any moment they could find themselves with a tule rack on top of their car headed to a national park. It could be 4 p.m. on a Saturday when they might get a call. Hey, man, you know what we need to do? Kayak, then camping right now. I'm on my way to get you. There's no time to change clothes. <laughs> Though it is unlikely that they will receive this call, white people hate the idea of missing an opportunity to enjoy outdoor activities because they weren't wearing the right clothes. If you plan on spending part of your weekend with a white person, it is strongly recommended that you purchase a jacket or some sort of high-performance t-shirt, which is just like a regular shirt, but a lot more expensive. <laughs> okay, so here's the thing. This is brilliant to me as a social psychologist because I, I look at that, and if you're a white person, you might go down his list and be like, hey, not all white people are like that, right? And you might be even a little bit offended. Um, and I would say, touche, that's true. Not all white people are like that. But if white people are they to you, which they are to me, I do not identify as white. So when I think about white people, I'm like, yes, they. I look at this list and I'm like, oh my gosh. That is exactly how white people are, right? I mean, that's how I perceive white people. I know one white person who fits that description, therefore, they are all the same. I can make the same mistake that my friend John did, because as soon as I make a distinction between us and them, all of a sudden, they are all the same. And so I can look at this list and just agree with everything. And this is a natural consequence of the way that we simply categorize our world. I don't think anyone means to do this, but we categorize everything. And one of the downsides of categorizing is that we make us-them distinctions. And as soon as we say they, we say they are all the same. Now here's the thing. Sometimes it can be a little bit funny. Sometimes it can be awkward. But it can actually be really extremely hurtful, particularly when we're trying to honor the image of God in each other. Because one way of thinking about they are all the same is saying there's not a lot of richness and variability that they bring to the table. I don't actually need to get to know them because I know one of them. And so I can just assume that they are all the same. Or I can say to myself, you know, I already, I already get them. There's not much to get. And so when someone says something to me and I really should be listening, I'm going to just ignore it and say, eh, I understand. I got it. I don't really need to hear your personal story. I, I have this wonderful um, job. I love going around and helping um, different groups, some of them Christian, think a lot more about, gosh, how do we love everyone well, even people who are different than us? And I get to work with a lot of Christian colleges. And I was at, um, not too long ago, I was hanging out with the board of trustees and the president of a college, Christian college, a lot like um, Azusa Pacific. And they had called me because they said, you know, we are having a really hard time attracting and retaining people of color. Staff, students, faculty, like students come here and faculty come here and they, after a year or two, they say, you know what, I don't think you guys really get this diversity in the family of God thing. I think you want to, but I don't feel loved. I don't feel accepted. I don't feel included in this community. So this president called me up and said, can you come spend some time with our board of trustees? We want to make some changes. And so I did and I said, you know, um, we can work on this, but I think before we implement some sort of diversity program, we should probably talk to people who've been involved with the school, who are people of color, and get a sense of what their experiences have been like. That way we can be addressing real issues. And so the president said, that's a great idea. And the president's a white guy. He's really nice. He loves, um, he loves, his, he loves the community that he's leading. He loves the people. He wants to be inclusive. And so he said, why don't you drop a plan of, um, of how we can go and kind of survey different alums and talk to them on the phone and get a sense of what their experience has been for people of color. I came up with a plan and I brought it back to him and he said, this is a great plan. And I said, thanks. And he said, okay, but I feel like this plan is going to take a lot of time and it's going to take a lot of energy. And um, we could go and talk with all these people of color or I could probably just tell you why they don't want to be a part of our organization. And I was like, okay, wait, let me get this straight. You're the white leader 
of a Christian college that admittedly has a problem with diversity? And he said, yes. And I said, and you think you can fix that problem without actual input from diverse people? And he was like, well, when you put it that way, it sounds really bad. <laughs> and I was like, because it is bad. This is horrible. Um, <laughs> um, and as we were talking, I could still feel the love in his heart. I could still feel how much he seeks to honor God. But it became really, really clear that he had done what so many of us do. He had said, they are all the same. Outgroup homogeneity. They are all the same. We don't actually need to talk to them because what the perspective that they bring is monolithic and simplified and, and actually it's so simple that I can approximate what they would have to say even though I have no idea what it's like to walk a mile in their shoes. Or sometimes people say, why don't we just get one of them, a token, and that one can speak for all of us. And so what starts as just a casualty of the way that we categorize, something that just happens without us even knowing, can quickly become something that dishonors the image of God and those that we're actually seeking to honor in that moment. This president wanted to honor people of color, but because he wasn't aware of the way that he was categorizing, he ended up dishonoring them. Thank God we have access to a better way. This might be the way that we naturally interact with each other, but this doesn't have to be the way. I love, love, love what Paul, the Apostle Paul calls us to in Philippians 2. And this whole, this whole chapter just wrecks me and challenges me every time I read it. But at the beginning, Paul is saying, here's how I want you all to be. And so he starts by saying, and I'm reading from the voice, but there might be another, um, is there a slide for this? I wasn't sure. Okay, well, I can read it to you. So I'm going to read from the voice, which I know is not a real translation, but just bear with me. It says, Philippians 2, 1, if you find any comfort from being in the anointed, if, his lo if God's love brings you some encouragement, if you experience true compa companionship with the Spirit, if his tenderness and mercy fill your heart, then brothers and sisters, here is one thing that would complete my joy. Come together as one in mind and spirit and purpose, sharing in the same love. I love what Paul is doing here because here in this first verse where he says, if you find any comfort from being in the, in the anointed, that's Jesus. If God's love, God the Father's love brings you some encouragement. If you experience true companionship with the spirit. So right there in that first verse, Paul is reminding us of the love of the Trinity. He mentions all three members of the Trinity in that, in that introduction to this love, saying, this is the type of love, this is the level of love and unity that I'm talking about. It's the Trinitarian love and unity. The Trinity is, is this beautiful, interdependent, equal, mutual relationship between three distinct, diverse entities who are so connected to each other that you can't actually be one without being in relationship with the other. The son cannot be the son without being in relationship with the father. The father cannot be the father without being in relationship with the spirit. They are distinct, but they, they inform each other. Their, their, their identities are interlocking. They don't make sense separate from each other. And there's a love that flows from that. Julian of Norwich, a, an early church mystic, said that that love in the Trinity was so powerful that out of the love and the laughter of the Trinity, hum, humans were born. Out of that intimacy and out of that love and that interdependence. And so Paul is saying, okay, this is the love I'm talking about. It's not like a, hey, nice to see you. How you doing? Don't have time to hear the answer to that, right? It's, a, it's an interdependence. It's a, I cannot be me without being in relationship with my brother who is Asian, American, is an immigrant. I cannot be me without my sister who is undocumented, and who has a different perspective on Christ than I do. I cannot be me without being in a relationship with my brother who's white and 65 years old and is experiencing America in an entirely different reality than I do because that's the love 
of the Trinity. And so Paul says, if you get this love, if you get it, then come together as one in mind and spirit and purpose, sharing in the same love. Now, I love how Paul invites us to be of one mind and one spirit. And that doesn't mean we all have to be the same. Because Paul is talking to the Philippian church, which was actually about as diverse as the American church. It was probably the, uh, the most diverse of all the early churches. So he knows who he's talking to. He's not saying you need to be clones. He's saying I want you to be of one mind. As a social psychologist, I think of this as sharing brain space. What does it mean for me to be inside your head and inside your experience? What is it like for you to be inside my experience so that you are asking the questions? Not, oh, she's one of them, but how can I know how you see God? How can I better understand your experience in our world? How can I dive deep into your pain? When you say something that challenges my worldview, how can I say, tell me more, instead of, oh, I already got them, I understand them, I already know all about them. The fact of the matter is, is because of the natural way that we categorize each other, because we tend to build these us-them distinctions, even in diverse spaces like this one, I mean, APU is probably one of the more di ethnically diverse of the, of the evangelical Christian colleges. But you know what's so interesting is it's so easy for us to be surrounded by diversity and still live into that us-them mindset. To still create a community where we might be walking by people in the hallways, we might be sharing a lab space with them in our biology lab, but we still are not sharing brain space. And so when people come and they say things like, my life does not matter as much as your life does, which is one of the messages of the Black Lives Matter movement, it can be easy for people who aren't black to say, oh, come on, all lives matter. I know black people. I get it. Rather than saying, tell me more. How can I share brain space with you? How can I better understand where you're coming from? If we take that step, we might learn some things about our world that are difficult to grapple with. We might hear some things that challenge our worldview, that challenge our perceptions of the way things are. One of my colleagues in social psychology has done a lot of work looking at this. How are people perceived based on their race here in the United States, even in diverse spaces on college campuses? And he created this amazing study that's been replicated so many times, looking to see, are black men automatically perceived as more dangerous than white men? And even though we live in a, in a supposedly egalitarian world and a de democratic world and we want to believe that everyone's treated exactly the same and everyone's perceived exactly the same, that's simply not true. And he wanted to test that hypothesis. He, are, is there a categorically different perception of black men than white men in our world? And so he created this study and what he did was he took pictures of uh, black men and white men, and he presented them subliminally to participants in his study. So um, a subliminal message for those of you who are not social psychology um, students um, are pictures or, or messages that are presented so quickly that the person who's seeing them cannot consciously say that they've seen them. So it turns out that if something's presented to you at like less than 30, 300 milliseconds or so, um, you won't be able to say that you saw it, although you will be uh, impacted by it because there are levels of consciousness, right? So um, you might not be conscious that you're conscious of something, but you'll be, you'll be affected by it. And then right after showing either a picture of a black face or a white face, he would show a picture of either a gun or a tool. Now the, the gun or tool picture was not subliminal. It was flashed really quickly. But people were able to say that they had seen something, but it was, flash, it was flashed so quickly that they kind of had to take a guess. He said, you know what, take your best guess, is this a gun or is this a tool? And so he would either pair a white face with a gun or a black face with a tool or a white face with a tool or a black face with a gun. And he had them go through ton, like 100 different trials and he said, just as quickly as possible, 
as accurately as possible, just say whether you saw a gun or a tool. And one of the things he found was that when people had been subliminally shown a black face and then shown a tool, they were likely to make an error and misidentify that tool as a gun. But if people had been subliminally shown a white face and then shown a tool, they were likely to make an error and misidentify that, tool, that gun as a tool. So they associated black men with guns and white men with tools. They associated black men with danger and white men with safety or industriousness or something like that. This study was shattering in the world of social psychology because it was one of the first studies that showed evidence of this non-conscious bias, right? Students of all races showed this bias. People of all different ages showed this bias. Something that we just inherit by being part of our culture, this natural association. When I told my brother, who's African American, he's a year older than me, I told him the results of this study. He looked at me with a tear in his eye and he said, why would anybody bother to waste time conducting that research? Anyone who talks to a black man or is a black man knows that we are hunted in our society. Anyone who's sharing brain space with a black man, rather than just seeing them as they, anyone who is saying, tell me more, would know that we are seen first and foremost as dangerous. And he said that last year, while he was finishing up his Master's of Divinity degree at Yale Divinity School in Connecticut, walking the two blocks from the Divinity School to his apartment, he was stopped and held and frisked by the New Haven police four times in the course of one school year, simply because he matched the description of someone that, he was looking, that they were looking for. Imagine being a black man who's training to be a pastor, who stopped over and over and over and over again and seen first and foremost as dangerous. When we share brain space with people, we might hear some things that we wish weren't true, it might make us uncomfortable, it might challenge the way that we see the world. But the beauty of being part of this family of God, the beauty of getting to celebrate the resurrection, to be part of this new world that God's creating, is that when we lean into this, good things happen. And Paul so rightly sees the church as the solution to this problem. Paul says, I get it, you guys are diverse. And that's the power because you're diverse like the Trinity is diverse. You're diverse like your God is diverse. And as people who are created in the image of God, as people who are empowered by God, you can do things differently. You don't have to go on autopilot and say they are all the same and, and keep, keep um, supporting these us-them distinctions. He said, you can tap into this love that the members of the Trinity just share with you. You can complete my joy by coming together as one in mind and spirit and purpose, sharing in the same love. I start this by saying simply, tell me more. That's one small way. When something happens on campus, like what happened recently with students dressing up in sombreros and, um, and appropriating each other's culture, rather than reacting and saying, no, 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 I get it, like I'm right, or this group is right, or picking sides, can you say, tell me more, why was this so hurtful to you? Did this dishonor the image of God in you? Because only you can tell me the answer to that. I can't tell you the answer. 
So let's start with that. Just tell me more. I'm going to pray for us. God, I thank you for being a diverse God. I thank you for being one who invites us into the intimacy of the Trinity. May we be interdependent. May we be mutual. I thank you for this group. I thank you that all of us are created in your image. May that truth be communicated on this campus. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.